Bath at the end of November, the new world champions entered only one Stratus for the Lombard RAC. Sandro Minari was on his own. Until the last moment, Lancia hadn't intended sending their Italian star to the Rally of the Forest at all. Well, they're still coming in. Sandro had been due for a rest after winning the world title. But when Valdegard signed with Ford for 1977, Minari was told to take over his RAC Stratus. Was Minari worried by the loss of his Swedish teammate? No, 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 he's okay. He's in, I think he's, uh, for me, you know, he's, I think he's not, uh, there is not a difference. Uh, I like to, to be only with uh, one car because like this, the service, they can do it uh, better, the, the, the work on, on the car, only one car. Timo Mackinen started the favourite, having won the RAC three times in a row. With Valdegard taking his place in the fourth, Anders Kulang and Rano Altenen. Like Opel, Fiat were again on Pirellis, and they adopted a narrow version of the P7 for the deep grooves of the forest stages. Fiat's flying fin, Marco Allen, said why he liked the RAC. In the end, for me, it's RAC's best rally in drivers. Why? No training and secret. All place in new. Simo Lampinen on the advantages of narrow tyres. Out of my experience, I know in Scandinavia when we drive in snow, only the narrow tyres do well there. Now, of course, the gravel can't be attacked the same way quite, but I think a narrow tyre, when it's loose enough, is giving an advantage. Tyres, fuel, electrics, components. The rally circus had come to town for the final big show of the year. The entry was spectacular. Over 200, of which the first 30 were top internationals and eight national champions. The cars, Lancia, Opel, Saab, Toyota, Datsun, Fiat, Mercedes, Triumph, Chrysler, and 73 Ford Escorts. The city of Bath was at home to 18 countries from east and west as the start drew near on the last Saturday in November. Anderson was one of the Scandinavians attracted to the west of England by the most competitive rally entry in years. After days of rain, there was some welcome winter sunlight for the start in the elegant heart of Bath. Herr Inge Wolfridson was in the chequered flag Stratus. Last minute preparations by Rano Altenen. Swedes and Finns, Germans and Italians. They were all there to contest Britain's biggest motorsporting occasion. Timo McInerney and Henry Lytton, seeded number one, Escort RS 1800. From Bath, the competitors drove north, cross the Seven Bridge and tackle four special stages in the Forest of Dean. There, on stage three, one of the likeliest home winners, Russell Brooks, Escort 16, had faulty rear shock absorbers and a whole chapter of troubles which finally put him out, lying second. The Fiat Mia Fioris on their first outing in Britain showed they're a force to be reckoned with. This is the Verini and Russo 131. Marco Allen proved his Thousand Lakes win was no fluke. At Scotch Corner on the first night, he was lying third. Roger Clark's escort never missed a beat, and the king of British rallying was at his best. Vattenen, at four minutes six for the three and a half miles, was fastest on this and the next stage in the forest. Opal 
Wales had an unhappy RAC, getting only one car through all 76 stages. This is Walter Roll just before he broke a half shaft. <laughs> Tarmac specialist Bocelli had his problems on the loose stages, losing a wheel on one of them, but he proved the potential of the 131 and was Fiat's best finisher, 10 seconds outside the top 10. Jean-Luc Terrier, this time in a Toyota. Sandro Minari won five stages and kept the Alitalia Stratus in one piece for four days and 2,000 miles. Quite an achievement if it's true that the Italian prefers pace notes and practice to blind rallies like this one. Toyota team manager Uwe Anderson in the 16 valve Corolla. It was to be one of his best drives ever. Simo Lampinen and Mike Wood, escort. They later went off in Kielder Forest, in one of the few spots where there were no spectators to help. Tony Fouts, escort, showing his best form of the year, but he went off the road and out of the rally on the last night in Wales. Cultures, minutes after his TR7 clouted a gatepost on the speech house stage. But the big story of the RAC this first day was the Finn Pentiaricola. After six stages, he had a clear two and a half minute lead. Tony Pond pushed his TR7 to the limit. He was second at Scotch Corner that night, but then had problems in Kielder. John Taylor, the rallycross expert, he rolled his RS a couple of hours later at Sutton Park. One man saved the reputation of the Opals, Anders Kulang. His was the only cadet to stay in the hunt after the Forest of Dean. Wolfridson in the chequered flag Stratus. For a time, he was ahead of Minari's works last year. Then after stage 19, broken points ended a good effort. <laughs> Timo Mackinnon had rolled his escort on the previous stage. Perhaps he was trying too hard for that fourth consecutive RAC victory. He soon retired. Ford boss Peter Ashcroft explains why. Uh, Timo had a roll on the second stage, and then on the third stage, uh, something went wrong with his axle, we think, due to the roll on the second stage. We think that he sideswiped the bank and uh, did some damage to the axle. Bjorn Valdegard, the man who took Timo's place in the 14 for 77, arrives at the Kirkbride rest stop near Carlisle with a bent strut. How long have you got here? Huh? How long have you got here? When? How long? Uh, Hans will come and tell you. I think it's about one hour. It was seven on Sunday morning and the rally was nearly 24 hours old. Roger Clark had been driving carefully, but his gearbox had become a bit sticky and the mechanics decided to play safe and change it, together with the clutch. Sorry? What job are you on? We were just changing the, uh, the gearbox because we had a selector problem, but uh, nothing very serious. It just it's clicking when it's going into gear. How long did it take you? Oh, it'll take us about 20 minutes. Ford and Dunlop talk about tyres for the Lake District. The same kind of thing goes on between Pirelli and Fiat still in for the team prize with good stage times from Verini and Bocelli. Pirelli's Gianni Garibaldi says rallies make tyre development faster. Really, we spend a lot of time, but not really lots of money. I think that if you compare the money spent for uh, doing the same in the laboratory, I think it's a little less. Because if you start to make this in the laboratory they have lots of time for thinking and to developing and then must to send outside to make all the tests in uh, rally you have the big laboratory possible to found and the stress of the tires is uh, concentrate in narrow time Five. 
Pentiaricola changed a wheel bearing at Kirkbride, but he was still the rally leader by over two minutes. After the dawn stage on Kirkbride airfield, the rally turned south, back towards Bath through some old Lake District favourites, Withup, Dodd and Greystoke, where the mass of spectators are gathered by 8 o'clock in the morning. In spite of a serious accident to young spectators the previous day and the warnings and whistles from the marshals, crowd control had become very difficult by the time Roger Clark roared through. Ireland's Billy Coleman was right on top of things in the RAC after an indifferent year. Auricular at Greystoke, the end of the long straight. Minari Stratus was still trouble-free, and the straights let him pour on the power. Verini's Arbath 131. He would go on to win the Vauxhall and Bewdley stages by a second, and Porlock by four seconds from Roger Clark. Tony Fawkes and Brian Harris, they reached the midway stop at Bath among the 106 survivors. 94 dropped out on this first leg of 1,500 miles. Meanwhile, what about Saab? Stig Blomquist in the new 1990 EMS was fastest on a Kielder stage, and he was content with third place for the moment. Marco Allen, still having gear selection problems with the 131, which you too can buy in Britain for about 18,000 pounds. Per Eklund, his Saab 99 was trouble-free, though he had changed the steering rack after Kielder. Saab were threatening Fiat for the manufacturer's trophy. Andy Dawson, Datsun Violet, great things were expected of him this time, but stomach trouble, plus his teammate Shellstrom's retirement, knocked Nissan out of the event. Tony Pond, well down the leaderboard after his crash in Kielder. Now with spectators pressing across the competitor's path, Greystoke was cancelled. All the driver's efforts have been for nothing. In wind and rain next morning at the faraway countryside park, animals outnumbered spectators. Two Dorset stages had been cancelled because of flooding, so drivers were still fresh from their overnight rest in Bath. What was Auricula's lead now, as crews came in for lunchtime service? Do you know how far you're leading the rally? How many seconds? Uh, we are about two minutes and 40 seconds or something like that. Still. What is the, going to be your problems from now on? Is the car all right? The car is all right. Uh, it's uh, not, not any problems now. <laughs> I hope not in future. <laughs> Which other driver are you watching closest? Roger Clark. Clark and Auricola had just tied for first place on the Wiscombe Park hill climb, but as yet it was no needle match. After one of his leanest years on record, Roger was quietly determined to repeat his first RAC win in 72, even if that meant letting Penty set the pace until the final night. So what's the, what do you think of the RAC so far? Well, it's been wet, generally. Otherwise, um, good fun. How, how bad is this problem of spectators on the special stages? Um, it has been a bit dangerous, yeah. Uh, someone probably sized the rally too much, I think. Isn't it infuriating for a top-seated driver like you when the organisers go and cancel two stages that you've nearly killed yourself to win? Yeah, it's a bit of a shame, but uh, safety must come uh, first, I think. You know, it's uh, not much fun to start hurting people. <laughs> In the forest of Greystoke the previous day, it was a miracle no one was hurt. Near to Penrith and the Lakes, Greystoke was one of the spectator stages widely advertised in advance, a policy to be reconsidered before the RAC in 77. The stage was well marked, there were plenty of marshals at dangerous points, but the sheer weight of numbers led to cancellation 
after about 50 competitors had gone through. Opal were having mixed fortunes. Kulang, number 19, was now their one survivor. He'd done well to get within two seconds of Roger Clark at Wiscombe Park. The Eurohandler cadets were serviced by the Pirelli tire bus from Germany, and with only one crew left, they'd plenty of time and food and drink to spare for other competitors. Roger Clark had a quick snack with his new Ford colleague, Valdegard. Outside, the downpour went on and on. I've got 60 on the front of the Thank you. Thank you. Put it on. Eat when you can. Verini had just tied with Marco Allen on Wiscombe and would go on to win Porlock. An early rally leader had been Hanu Mikula. Most of the bugs on the two-litre Toyota were sorted out, but he would retire with transmission trouble, despite some excellent service. Billy Coleman was fourth at the end of the first leg, and after hitting another car which made the handling bad, he still managed to finish sixth, a fine drive. What was Clark's lead now? We're about uh, two minutes at the moment, I think. And how are you going to play it from here on? As well as we can, we've got Wales to go through tonight, and uh, looks like being a wet night, and anything could happen. In Wales, on the forest stages around Snowdon, Glacynog, and the Dovey Valley, Roger Clark made his big effort. Time was running out for the leader, Auricola. When the cars reached the old gold mine in the Coedy Brennan Forest, Clark knew that Auricola's exclusion for lateness would probably be upheld. So Blomquist in the Saar was now his nearest rival in the Welsh forests. First, though, there was spectator trouble at Beth Gellert. The organisers cancelled the stage because, they claimed, parked cars had prevented marshals flagging the route in time. Other reasons given to weary drivers like Sandro Minari included faulty course clocks and the need to make up 45 minutes lost through an accident in the night. Either way, thousands of spectators and marshals had arrived at Beth Gillard with hours to spare and feelings ran high. Brian Culture's service crew had changed the gearbox in his TR7 in 52 minutes to keep him in the rally. Clearly, the old Abingdon spirit still lives on. Overall, the Triumph did better than anyone expected. What do you think of all these cancellations, Brian? Well, oh, good for me. I might get to the end now. I'll have to cancel the rest of them. Why, do you know where you are? No, no I think Everybody we're in the top 15 somewhere, but, um, you know, we're only just struggling along. What's the problem? The gearbox. Come on. Beth Gellert was the sixth special stage to be cancelled, but the decision was particularly harsh on spectators, because with the rally now running in a straight line south, there was no alternative action they could see. Straight on to the next passage control. Was it a problem with the course clocks this morning? No, no. It was um, a problem on the arrowing, actually. Arrowing? Yeah. Why? What couldn't you put them... Well, apparently there's... there's there's too many arrows to put up, and um, there wouldn't have been sufficient time for, before the cars arrived. So with spectators up in arms about the cancellation of stages, and the rally leader Auricola protesting about his exclusion for lateness, the Lombard RAC moved towards its climax among the waterfalls and flooded streams of the Dovey Forest in central Wales. Seven stages still had to be fought out before the finish in Bath that Tuesday night. On Diffie 2, where spectators enjoyed sweeping views of the surviving cars along the whole length of a valley, then for a mile uphill the other side, Pierre Eklund proved the potential of the new Saab 99 EMS. 
At 10 minutes 42 seconds, he was quicker here than Blomqvist, but would retire with a broken gearbox almost in sight of the finish. The Saab factory wanted their new two-litre saloon to do well on its first outing in Britain. They were not disappointed. Ireland's Billy Coleman in the Thomas Motors Escort RS 1800 would have the honour of being the first Escort privateer to reach home. Billy was as quick here as Eklund Saab, and his final placing at six was a good effort after brake failure, clutch slip, punctures, fuel feed troubles, and a great deal of suspension and chassis damage, which made the handling unpredictable. seconds faster than Coleman, Bjorn Valdegaard on his Ford debut. With only a few hours experience of driving the Escort, he finished third. What would he have done in a Stratus? Sandra Minari, with the world title in his pocket, seemed well content to get his Stratus to the finish unmarked. He took it easy and came fourth. If he'd been trying to win, that would have been something to see. <laughs> Ulvi Anderson, fifth in the Toyota, fully made up for their failure on the RAC the previous year. The car was reliable, a throttle cable was the only thing to break. But when teammates Mikola and Jean-Luc Terrier retired, all Ulvi's tenacity and experience were needed to bring home the one surviving Toyota. Roger Clark, 10.22 here on Diffie 2, four seconds faster than his rival Auricola. Roger won every remaining test except one, when he was forced onto a wheel rim after a puncture. Roger's performance was better than many people gave him credit for. The early loss from the Ford Works team of Mackinnon and Vattenen left Clark looking vulnerable, and for three days he was two minutes or more behind the fastest man Auricola. His consistency was the key, and his timing of the attack on Penty that final night in Wales was difficult to fault. Mind you, it was a close run thing. Until stage 51 in the West Country, when the BDA engine in Auricola's escort suddenly went flat, Penty had a big enough lead to answer any fast time from Clark. But a broken inlet valve, and finally clutch problems, put him out four stages from the end. Fiat lost the team prize to Saab, but the rally showed that the 131s are highly competitive. As the last cars drove south to Bath through the Welsh mist, the rally year was ending, as it had begun in Monte Carlo, with three men influencing the scene, Italian Sandra Minari, Sweden's Bjorn Valdegard, and Englishman Roger Clark. But as Roger toasted his second RAC victory, the Stuart Pegg, there was a technical hitch. Stig Blomqvist was four minutes behind his old rival Clark, so Saab came second. Valdegard was third, and he found the sudden switch from Stratus to Escort difficult. Stratus is com two completely different cars, so it has been uh, hard work to, you know, you're working in the wrong way in the beginning, so you work too much maybe. 1976 was a year of surprises on the world rally scene. On the Monte, there was little snow and ice, regulations limited the teams to one kind of tyre, and Pirelli got it right first time with the P7 for Lancia. On the Safari, 
Everyone expected Lancia to sweep the board. Yet after record practice times, Minari and Valdegard were knocked out of this East African Classic by suspension and engine failures. By the end of the year, in the forests of Britain, Sandro Minari and his Lancia Stratus were the world title holders once again. When Sandro came back to Bath at the end of the REC, the crowd gave him a welcome worthy of a world champion. Rally car, 257, brake horsepower, V6 engine, very, very light car indeed, and it's far from easy to drive. Did you always rally this year? Any drier for you than last year? Yes, same. Much better. Sure. But two years ago, I was more uh, happy. Why? I was <laughs> Sandro Minari could afford to be philosophic about coming forth, for within a few weeks he'd won the Monte Carlo Rally for a fourth time on a Pirelli Shod Stratus. Another world championship year was underway.